I live in Texas in a suburb outside of Houston, Fort Bend County, and it's just me. And I, I am so just mind blown. How did you feel about working there for so long, having a, the deputy chief appraiser ask you specifically to commit fraud? How did that make you feel? Um, it made me untrusting, totally untrusting and on guard. And I knew at that point then that my uh, the, the process, the appeal process mm -hmm. was in jeopardy. Did you notify anyone about this fraud? Actually, I did. I reached out to a state representative. Breaking news as I've just drove and arrived to Dallas from Houston, Texas to meet with a whistleblower, ex-ARB state chair, who's gonna go over the systemic fraud that's happening in relation to the CAD Central Appraisal District. So ask this whistleblower questions like, what are they doing to essentially commit fraud? And as homeowners fighting our assessed value, what can we do about it? Are we gonna get a refund on our money? Is this fraud existing? This whistleblower, you guys, needs us to push this video. We cannot get this message out without your help. So do everything you can to like the video, share it, get it into the authorities' hands, because this one is gonna be major. Madam Mole, can we start by kind of just telling the viewers, you know, were you asked to commit fraud? Um, explain to the viewers what your position used to be with the state. Uh, I know you're an ex-chair, uh, but just start there if you can. I was a, um, an ARB member for six years with the local CAD, and then I moved up to vice chair and then eventually to the chairship. And were you asked to commit fraud? Uh, in my last year, yes, sir. I was asked uh, by the deputy, then deputy chief appraiser uh, to commit fraud. Okay, what type of fraud were they asking you to commit? Well, at that time, there was not the ability for taxpayers to... Uh, have hearings with one person panels and the uh, the appraisal district wanted me to run uh, one person panels so that they could cycle through as many cases as possible that way divide up the ARB and everyone do one person panels okay and just and you know for the viewers what she's referring to is as homeowners we have the ability to protest the value of our houses and what she is essentially saying is is you know one of the many things and we'll uncover a lot here guys is basically that they are rushing that process and the, the reason why that's such a bad thing is if if you rush the process, if you do an informal protest, generally you're not going to get any benefits. So they're rushing people through. Um, now, you know, did how did you feel about that? How did you feel about working there for so long, having a, the deputy chief appraiser ask you specifically to commit fraud? How did that make you feel? Um, it made me untrusting, totally untrusting and on guard. And I knew at that point then that my... Uh, a, the uh, the process, the appeal process, mm -hmm. was in jeopardy. Did you notify anyone about this fraud? Actually, I did. I reached out to a state representative who had been previously involved the year before because of some other fraud that was going on within the district where the taxpayers were being obstructed from their due process anyway. And so I reached back out to that state representative. Um, they made some inquiries and then they dropped the ball. So you reached out to the guy that was involved in fraud to report fraud, is, is that fair to say? <laughs> well, I reached out to a state representative who is supposed to be working for the people hmm. and uh, informed them that, of what was going on and asked them for help and they made a phone call to the district and they wrote a letter to the district and then pretty much dropped the ball. Okay, so did it solve anything? No. Okay, and you know, just for the viewers, if I'm not mistaken, you're, it's in the process, I know we have an active lawsuit, but you're essentially gonna be one of the star witnesses uh, informing the judge, the attorneys of the fraud that you witnessed. Now, I have some testimony to go. I have about, you guys, you know, for the viewers, I have about 300 pages here of testimony that I'm going to go over with you um, that I think is absolutely mind-blowing. But for the viewers, can you explain how are the central appraisal districts 
coming up with a value. And guys, obviously we're talking about taxing our homes. <clears throat> the reason this is such a big deal is that we're not talking about a carton of milk here. We're talking about the, one of the biggest purchases and assets of someone's lives. And so if they're taxing and stealing us behind our backs, we don't even know about it until it's too late. You know, it's bad, our, you know, but again, can you explain to us how the Central Appraisal District is valuing homes and does math matter? Well, math does matter. Of does course. it matter to them? No. Why? Uh, values matter to them and deadlines matter. And you can consistently get that information by listening to board meetings that it's all about deadlines. And so when you say value, why, why would the value be important? Is that the revenue? Is the value, you know, is the revenue based on the value that they're assessing? Uh, yes. So the higher the value, the more revenue they get. Is that correct? Correct. So how are they determining, you know, now, by law, they are supposed to create value based on how appraisers are, right? There, there's a policy by law um, to create value. There is a legal way to do that, and there is a specific guidelines. But they're not using those guidelines. They're not creating value that way. Is that can, can you just, I'm still struggling, and I know we've talked. I still don't understand how they're creating value. Well, are they making out of thin air? I mean, how are they, how are they it's a non-disclosure state. I'm not reporting my value to the appraisal district. How are they coming up with this? What math are they using? Well, let me give you an example, and maybe you can put it in perspective. If you were purchasing a home, most likely you would hire what's called a fee appraiser. A fee appraiser is an independent appraiser who comes in for a fee that you pay, and they completely go over your home. They go inside, they go out, they pull comps, of course, within your neighborhood, very much within your neighborhood. They compare your home uh, in, in very much in, by detail uh, as in the components. They mm -hmm. follow what's called USPAP, USPAP mm -hmm. regulations and standards. But then you have the appraisers within a CAD who do what's called mass appraisal. Mass appraisal is a very different thing. Mm -hmm. So it stands to reason that if you have a certified appraisal in your hand from a fee appraiser and you take that appraisal to the appraisal district who has issued you a value that you feel is not mm -hmm. anywhere near the value of your home and you present that, then that appraisal should be the accepted method. Yeah. So what happens though, at the appraisal districts and actually before an ARB very easily is that those appraisals will be rejected. Uh, I, in fact, I can give you a conversation that I had just had with a taxpayer mm, three days ago who was describing his process before the ARB who had actually a fee appraisal in his hand. Okay, so for the viewers, an ARB is an appraisal review board. As a homeowner, I have a legal right to protest my value. That's when I protest my value, an ARB, I go basically an A or B reviews my information and they decide whether or not to reduce my value. Uh, so please continue. So this particular individual went before the ARB. He was there contesting the value. He had the fee appraisal. His appraisal was already coming in at approximately 150000 less mm. than what the appraisal district had assigned a value to his property. So he asked the appraiser to describe his property. The appraiser went through her description of the property, which was not accurate. He corrected her and told her, no, those, those components that you're listing are not accurate. And then he, he told the ARB, I have a fee appraisal here. It's coming in for considerably less than what the district has valued mm -hmm. me at. And what happened out of that process is he asked her specifically, how did you value my property? if I can ask that on the record. And she told him, I pulled pictures off of the internet and looked at your property. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at what's called the property field card, mm -hmm. which is a, an internal document that the taxpayer can get, but it has a lot of components. And that's how she valued mm -hmm. his property. Okay. 
That well, it was not within use PAP standards. Well, then that's illegal to do it against the Correct. law. Because essentially what you're saying is, is you're taking two parties. They're both supposed to adhere to the same law. Correct. You have the county doing mass appraisals, making tons of mistakes. So then you get a, an individual appraiser do an actual thorough appraisal, again, which the county is supposed to do. Yes. And instead of the county taking that appraisal, understanding, okay, this is an official uh, this is a certified appraisal uh, by penalty of you know felony. You right. can't just make up appraisals, and they disregard that report and they stick with the assessment value, which is roughly one hundred and fifty thousand more than yes. the appraisal that was done. Is that that so, can happen? So how is that legal? I, I don't. I, I'm still not understanding. Where did they get the extra one hundred fifty thousand to assess? Where's the one hundred fifty thousand coming from? With the district? Yes, where, with, the, with the assessment value from the district. Good question. Okay, well, so we don't know that. Unbelievable. All right, well, I have another question. This question is, okay, property value valuation study. All right, I, and then we'll get to the testimony after this. Now, I've been talking to Mitch Vexler, okay, and you know he's educated me a little bit on property uh, valuation studies, and during this conversation with him, it seemed like some neighborhoods can be targeted over others. And not only does it seem like certain neighborhoods are targeted for higher assessment value, it also seems like they are commingling funds. Are, are, are they sending revenue to outside districts? And, and can you explain the property valuation study and are they targeting certain neighborhoods over others? Well, every appraisal district goes through the property value study uh, dictated by the state comptroller's office every other year. Mm -hmm. And what happens is if uh, the property values in a particular area fall below what the state comptroller has deemed should be the values for that area, then those school districts fall, uh, they become invalid. So then what happens is the process, they have a, a, an, a, a, an ability to do submit information for corrections. In our case, during my last year, we had three, uh, three school districts that fell out of compliance, essentially. They never did come off the second year, but on the third year, which kept them from losing their state funding. Oh, state man. funding, they got back into compliance. The way that they got back into compliance is the appraisal district had to target those areas, go in and raise the property values to get to get them up to what the state comptroller deemed was 100% hmm. of the property and, value. And, and can, can you explain where does it say in the appraisal law that someone can deem uh, a property a certain amount to save a school? Does it say that anywhere in the appraisal law and guidelines to generate value? Is that is that any is any consideration supposed to be taken for a school going bankrupt? Should my property value be higher to save a school? My opinion, no. Okay. Well, should fraud be committed then to save a school, do you think? Absolutely not. So what should happen to save a school? I think that is probably with every taxing entity, it's not just schools. Now we're getting into a bigger situation, mm -hmm. but these taxing entities need to get their spending in control. They're out of control. They're, they're like addicts. Mm -hmm. So they have, the taxpayer is their cash cow. Mm -hmm. So when they have unlimited funds, there's not a reason to get themselves in check. And until that happens, you're really not going to be able to fix that situation. Okay. So, you know what's amazing to me, madam? Uh, what are we calling you again? Madam something, madam. Uh, what was that? Mole. Madam Mole. Um, you know, it's really surprising to me. They're, they're doing all this overvaluation fraud. So they're getting too much revenue and the schools are still going bankrupt. How can you explain that other than fraud and corruption? Can you explain that to me? If, if they're receiving more revenue or they should be receiving more revenue and they're still going bankrupt, can you explain why you think that might be? Well, again, it comes back to overspending greatly. But then you're getting into a much bigger situation that have, has to do with bonds and floating bonds and, and a much bigger issue. And okay. this really is a bigger issue okay. than just on the local. Can you go into uh, maybe bonds? Do you, do, you, do you think that 
people's pensions can get wiped out over this? Absolutely. Okay. Are you worried about certain teacher pensions, maybe like in California, uh, I think it's called CalPERS. Are you worried about that? Within Texas? Yes, sir. I'm not. I know that this is going on in other states. But within Texas, it's already having an effect. Do you think that they don't have enough money to pay these pensions? Absolutely. Okay. Do you think that this may be, that may be one reason why they're trying to um, you know, blow up home values to cover that missing money to pay those pensions? Do you think that may be one reason? It could be. I think it's more on a localized level with your taxing entities. Again, they're addicts. Okay. Well, speaking of uh, localized level, let's go into, you know, I have maybe 200 pages of testimony here. Uh, these are official, it's official testimony uh, done under penalty of perjury. Yeah. And I've taken some notes here, and I, I'm wondering if you can help me understand what's going on here. You're more educated than me, probably at many things, but specifically, you know, appraisal districts and how they generate value. Now, this is a Denton County Commissioner court meeting that was held on Tuesday, August 31st of 2021. Now, what's very interesting, now I'm about to quote the mayor of Lakewood Village. Okay, again, this is the mayor of Lakewood Village. This is a, a Denton court meeting. And this is what the mayor says, okay? Lakewood Village, I will not put out numbers I know are false. Again, the mayor is reporting he will not put out the numbers he knows are false. So we've told Michelle French not to certify our numbers because she has the wrong inputs. They're wrong, and this is crazy, across the county. So one situation is to get them to recertify that what you want them to do. Give everyone the correct numbers. They have the numbers, it's in their database. Can you explain why the mayor, why you think perhaps the mayor would not be certifying this? I mean, why does the mayor think that the comps and the value is false? Well, I can actually speak to that because it was directly on my watch. Okay. And that is goes back to the fraud that I was telling you that was committed by the appraisal district that I was the ARB chair. That year, what happened was as a result of me being asked to run one-person panels, and I refused to, and the numbers going into the system were already corrupt. The deputy chief appraiser okay. told me in a conversation that they were, uh, they were uh, not going to make it uh, this was long before we started the appraisal uh, review process, the, the protest season. Mm -hmm. Those numbers were not going to be right. And then at that point, what happened is after the district did not make their 95% certification, which is mm -hmm. the major, that's what they're all working for every year, the chief appraiser at that time put properties that had not been protested but were under protest, supposed to come before my people, put them into being settled to count them on to the 95%. And then after the 95% was reported to the state, pulled them back out of that system. What that mm -hmm. did was it triggered to Michelle French tax notices and many taxpayers that year got multiple tax notices wanting more money. And so you know, the code is very specific. The, ta the tax assessor collector cannot levy a value on a property until it the protest has been completed. Those properties had not. So that is part of the evidence that I gathered that year. Okay. So... Mm, okay, let me just reiterate what you just said. So in order to be compliant, they have to have a 95% certification rate. They take properties that are not certified yet under protest. They put it in that 95% bucket so that they can clear whatever clearance they need to be okay for that year. And then after that's done, they re-remove those that data, those properties, and then they allow them to protest. But in addition to that fraud, you're also saying that they were trying to go from a three-person ARB to a one-person ARB to push along the protest process because, correct me if I'm wrong, they don't want people protesting the value because wouldn't that mean they would receive less money from the taxpayer? 
It, it could, actually, depending yeah. on what happened in the ARB hearing, yes. And you know what's very interesting? We don't even have to guess. I actually have this transcripts here. Uh, now, this is uh, from a board meeting. This is the DCAD, Dallas County Appraisal District board meeting. This was 10-12-23. Okay, now this is the chief appraiser, Don Spencer. Uh, I believe at the time he may have been a deputy chief, but right now he's the chief appraiser, okay? And this is very interesting because when we look at these transcripts, when you go to minute 2711 to about 2847, there's one specific thing uh, that's very interesting. He's basically explaining how they're creating value. And he's basically saying there's a lot of workaround. This is word for word now. There's a lot of workarounds that have to happen with our current software program. So he's suggesting workarounds. He goes on at minute 3106 stating, DCAT is addressing software issues, this is the crazy part, outside of the software system, but it cannot provide the correct value info for tax billing. Employee Rebecca has to go in, correct the data on the back end. So they're taking information out of the system, they're correcting it, they're putting it back in. So far, that seems like it's against the law. But let me read this last, I got a couple more. Minute 36, 38. Again, this is from the chief appraiser. This is Don Spencer. He's saying, he's justifying now about Rebecca. So he's talking about Rebecca. Rebecca running, is running the process outside of the software. Okay, and goes on. Even as unfortunate as it is, because what she's having to do is pull the data out of the system. And he says, word for word now, manipulate the data. This is word for word. This is, this is under penalty of perjury. This is testimony. He's saying they pull it out of the system, they manipulate the data, and then they put it back into the system. It goes on to minute 3821. Spencer says over 60,000 properties. That's not a small uh, area. 60,000 properties are being corrected outside of the software by Rebecca. Isn't that, isn't that fraud? Is, is there a law that says that they could manipulate data and then put it in the system? Is, there, is that legal for, for homeowners? I'm an American citizen. Is that, is that fraud or what, what would you make of that? It says fraud to me. Anytime you use the word manipulate, the connotation attached to that word is not a positive. Okay, so we have multiple, multiple layers of corruption and fraud. And I want to read one more testimony. Okay, this one's very interesting. I mean, I mean, they're, they're saying this. There's no guessing here, you guys. I mean, this is math matters, right? Two plus two will always equal four. It's not going to equal 27. Two plus two equals four. It's a universal. So this is from a board meeting, a DCAT board meeting. This was on Tuesday, February 15th, 2024. This is it's very interesting to me. This is a board member, okay? She's saying, this really frustrates me <laughs> because I can't believe they're saying this on the record. Okay, so they're basically saying, real compliant to the staff too. And they're talking about Texas now. This is not a full disclosure state. And a lot of these cells on a lot of these big tracks aren't disclosed. So they, they are, they are truly masters at guessing. Masters at guessing. Who's guessing? The appraisers, if you put that into, the, I'm very familiar with what you're talking about. If you put that into the full context mm -hmm. that that comment was made, mm -hmm. that is exactly what the conversation was. That's in a board of directors meeting with the Denton County Appraisal District. And they, they are having a conversation of the appraisers getting the job done. And what he's referring to is exactly what he says. They have to guess. Okay. They have to guess to make, to make the deadlines. Now, I know when coming up with appraisals, it's about an opinion, but it's an opinion based on math, and there are certain thresholds, gross net thresholds. Correct. Can you tell me in the appraisal law where it says it's okay to guess? Well, it's not. USPAP doesn't cover anything like that. So why do you think that they're saying this under oath? They're just stupid? Are they just on this hamster wheel of fraud and they just can't see past this hamster wheel? I mean, what, are yeah. they, why are they not getting it? I don't, I don't understand the misconnect here. Do, do, you, well, do you give us a little bit of light I, there? <laughs> perhaps I can. I think that what you have is a systemic unaccountability 
issue. All of these appraisal districts have never been held accountable. They're not. And they have no fear. They have no fear of being held accountable because essentially they have um, a green light by the uh, state comptroller's office to do what they have to do. The, all appraisal districts are owned by the taxing entities. Their budgets completely come from the taxing entities. Each one contributes a share according to how large they are. So these people are working for the taxing entities. You must connect the system to understand why it is the way that it is. Rebecca didn't have to guess. <laughs> Rebecca, according to this testimony, again, this is 101223. Uh, this is from uh, the chief appraiser. Rebecca, all she, Rebecca had to do was remove 60,000 properties and manipulate them and then put them back. That's not guessing. That's changing the data. What do you think that they were changing on the data? Uh, that probably was in reference to possibly exemptions, but it could have also been uh, numbers. I mean, there, there's no way to know what data is. Okay. If you can manipulate one portion of the data, mm -hmm. you can manipulate any portion of the data. Well, shouldn't we just trust them? Well, that's what they tell you, <laughs> but in, in reality, absolutely not. Okay. Now, obviously, this is a cumulative corruption. We don't know what they're doing, what's legal, what's not legal. It doesn't appear that there's any math whatsoever. It seems like they got to hit a budget. They're going to be out of compliance, and even then they're going to fraud uh, that time frame, um, the allowable time frame. Can the system be fixed? No. Mm, that's unfortunate. Now, let me ask you this. So as an example, I found before coming here a property that was over, it was for sale for 425. Okay, I can't sell it for 425. It's assessed for 550. I, you know, I want to protest it with the ARB. Say they admit it's less. Do, I mean, my, my question is, is, can I get a refund on my money? Can I get my money back? If, if we prove this fraud, if we prove the uh, corruption, they're violating the law, they're, they're not using simple math to make this work as is required, can I get my money back? No. Why? There's no mechanism in the system to allow for you getting your money back. <laughs> it's, it's theirs. Once they have it, it's theirs to keep. <laughs> All right, that's fair. I guess I ran into that one. I mean, I mean, you know, it's spent already. Do you think the money is spent already? Well, of course it's spent already. Budgets are already figured. Budgets are being figured for next year. That process started with all the taxing entities in April and May. Okay. Okay. All right, let me ask you this. Okay, so going back to the lawsuit, we have obviously, um, you know, Mitch Vexler and I, we put a video out really trying to spotlight what's going on because this is happening in multiple states. It's not just residential, it's commercial. Right. Uh, so it's my understanding that actually someone, a state official potentially has reached out to you to ask for your help to understand what the Central Appraisal di District is doing right or wrong. Does someone reach out to you? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, a group of elected officials in the southern part of the state did reach out to me. Uh, they're very concerned with what's going on. Um, many people have knowledge of this. They've been elected to serve on their local CAD boards, and they're there. They truly want to serve the taxpayers, but they do not understand the system that they've gotten themselves into. Okay. And what they're looking for is that inside information so that what they what they would like to do is to find ways to try to help their taxpayers. Okay. Now, when you meet with these state officials and you explain things, what do you hope to gain? I hope to educate them so that they understand that this problem is much bigger than just what they see on a daily basis. Okay. Now, obviously, as a citizen consumer, an appraisal review board, which is normally three people, that's a very important process. If, if I want fair taxes, I have my legal rights, very, it's very important. And so those people's jobs is to determine whether or not the property was assessed correctly or not assessed correctly, and so they look at evidence. And so my question is, is how are they hiring those people, and do they have appraisal or math 
experience? No, not necessarily. So is, 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 there, any, is there any requirements that, that you are familiar with in order to become a part of the ARB? Uh, well, there are requirements, and, but they're nothing to do with qualifications. Okay. There's, a, there's a very different, that's a very different angle. Okay. Requirements are that you must be a resident of the county that you live in for two years, et cetera, that sort of thing. Uh, 18 years or older. Okay. Very so, basic requirements, but so those are to, not qualifications. There's so I have nothing. to be living. Is, is yes, the, is you the have to live in the okay. in the county that you're applying and, for. And then, and then you're saying there's no. So can the janitor uh, that's that's taking out the trash behind us? Can he apply as long as he lives in that county to be an ARB member? Absolutely. Now, why why is a citizen consumer should I trust that person to give me a fair shake? Well, I guess I would have to ask you. Should you trust them? No, I don't want the janitor <laughs> acting like they're an appraiser. I want an appraiser act. I don't want an appraiser. I want an appraiser to be an appraiser. I want a fair shake. I want the county to admit to me that they've been over assessing me this entire time and I want a refund on my money. And I don't think that's gonna happen. And in fact, I, I don't hear, I don't hear the solution here. Can you tell me, you know, can we just end on, what do you hope to gain by coming forward blowing the whistle on what's going on, what do you hope to gain? What do, what, do we, what do you want the normal homeowner, consumer to learn, and how can they empower themselves so they're not a victim of the systemic fraud and corruption? It's time for taxpayers to stand up. It's time for taxpayers to get involved. It's time for taxpayers to understand that pressure needs to be applied. The system must be eliminated. It cannot be fixed. It's corrupt. It's bad to in every, every facet of this process. There's many people involved in this process and the creation of it, and it must be started from scratch. We need a new process. We need something other than what we have because this is not working, and if the taxpayers do not take a stand, if they can get involved with signing uh, Mr. Vexler's petition. Mm -hmm. Certainly they can do that, uh, but they need to do more. Okay. They need to put pressure on their legislators. They need to put pressure on their county officials, and they need to hold the taxing entities' feet to the fire. Okay. Should they run for office? Absolutely. Would you think that good people running for office on a county level would help? If they're good people. Well, that's the point, if, right? If, if they don't become part yes, of this corrupt yes. system. I mean, is there another way outside of that? I mean, how do we as people even stop the fraud? How do we even know about the fraud if, if the elected officials are the source of the fraud? It seems like it's an impossible challenge to overcome unless we're standing up. Now, I will have the petition, uh, I will have Mitch's petition linked in the description. Can you tell the viewers, and, and we'll end here, how long does it take to sign that petition? Oh, about 10 seconds probably. About 10 seconds? So <laughs> yeah. you're saying that if someone watches this and is sick and tired of these taxing jurisdictions, jurisdictions robbing us of affordability, robbing us of the American dream of home ownership, um, it takes 10 seconds to be a part of this movement Yes, sir. Unless, unless you're okay with, with your tax, your possibility of losing your home because it is attached to your property taxes, then you, you probably want to sign on and at least get your voice heard. Tell us your story. You know, let me ask you this, okay? Can, can, can we call an ARB an illusion of legitimacy? Well, that's exactly how, when I was training my ARB, I very, very frequently would remind them that they are an illusion created by the legislators to give the taxpayer the illusion of due process. Okay. Would you say that appraisal districts that you know, CADs that you know, that there is an extensive network of fraud? Yes, sir. Okay. Sign the petition. So, so, the, so if you can, for the viewers, help us understand the difference between the ARBs coming up potentially with value and then the appraisal district and how essentially ARBs are supposed to be independent. I guess they're not supposed to be qualified. They're just supposed to be alive, right? But that's, uh, the ARBs is something, from what I understand, designed to protect us as homeowner, citizen, consumers. Can you explain the difference in the ARBs in the, in the district? 
Well, the ARB is, is supposed to be, by definition, an independent uh, group of citizens, taxpayers like themselves, that are there to make an independent evaluation of their uh, property value. So, but what happens is uh, appraisal districts sign the paychecks for ARB members. So that comes straight from the appraisal district. Uh, if you look, you can see clearly when you go into an ARB hearing, they house in the same facility. Everything is controlled by the ARB. Now the code says that the ARB is independent, but the districts completely control the ARBs. And you Completely. were a chair. Yeah. And, and you personally overlooked several ARBs. So I believe that it's fair to say you are an expert on what happens behind the scenes. Well, I, I can tell you this, that my final year was uh, very contentious because I fought to hold the ground of the independence of the ARB and the district fought, fought me tooth and nail. It was a very contentious relationship. Uh, there, as I said, there was a lot of fraud going on. I was continuously reporting that fraud before I ever finished out my year to TDLR and letting them know what was going on. That's the licensing agency for uh, all appraisers. Uh, so yes, sir, there was a lot of Contention, but I will tell you in all fairness, most ARBs are so uh, docile that they allow the appraisal district to pretty much run herd okay. over them. And you know, for this extra work that you did, did you get a raise? Did you get an employee of the month certificate? Are you still working there? No, sir. I, I, it's by law, you can only serve three two-year terms, and I termed out after six years. So, so basically, as soon as you start figuring out what's going on, you can no longer work there. And therein lies the problem. That was my issue with the one-person panels. Any time that a taxpayer goes between but for just one person, then they put themselves at, the, at a disadvantage. Three heads are better than one when you're, when you're pleading your case. So that's a disadvantage. And yes, sir, it, you're right about Any qualification requirements on math or, or, or just understanding value? Is there anything no, there? No, there Who, are no qualifications. Who's doing the job interviews? Uh, well, there really is no job interview. An individual can submit their application, and the, that goes to the TLO, which is the Taxpayer Liaison Officer. That individual now, depending on the size of the county, because there are different avenues that that takes in, in, in a population over a million like we are, that now goes back to the fox that's guarding the hen house. That would be the appraisal or the uh, appraisal district's board of directors in our county now are the ones that choose the ARB board members, but prior any other counties, they're chosen by, appointed by an independent uh, district judge who has nothing to do with anything. Just this last thing, and I just wanted to make sure I understood this. So, you know, I pay roughly eh, $12,000 a year in property taxes. I'm probably over assessed by maybe like $3,000 in cost per year. It, just to reify this, you're saying that I can't get that money back. Correct. Even if I were to prove fraud. Correct. All right, so I've come all the way to the Denton Central Appraisal District to try to see if Don Spencer is available to talk into, you know, the corruption, the fraud, the lack of value calculation and things like that. So I figured, you know, might as well give him an opportunity. Here we are right here, you guys, the Appraisal District. You can see that. Let's see what happens. Look, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. Um, I'm actually, I'm working on a story and I'm wondering if Don Spencer is available to talk to, uh, to He's today. He's actually not in office today. He'll be back Monday. Okay. Hour and can I, can I make an appointment with him? Um. But if you can, let him know it's about a story about um, the corruption and fraud um, and basically the way that they're uh, calculating value for uh, Dan County. So there was a video published on, on that corruption and that fraud, and I was hoping that 
you know, he would be available to speak his side of things. Anything that would explain how am I calculating value, like something in writing, you know, like this is how we generate value, assessment value, it's the, the allegations of fraud and corruption are false, here's the math. Anything like that would be great. All of the internal evidence that I gathered surrounding the certification fraud that happened this year that you referred to that Dr. Vargas was, was alerting the commissioner's court about, I actually provided the evidence to TDLR and walked the investigator through all of the evidence. Sounds like you guys got an open and closed case here. We do.